Be forewarned, this one's gonna have a little bit of fire in it. And uh, I do use that phrase somewhat tongue in cheek because we're talking about Pentecost. And this is the day in the church calendar when we remember that the Holy Spirit came across the early church, inhabited them, and then they spoke with tongues of fire, which is probably a theopoetic way of saying, uh, man, they were on fire. <laughs> now, when we say spirit, especially Holy Spirit, we don't always know what we mean. In some sense, because throughout all of church history, Christian theologians have had difficulty writing about the Holy Spirit. And in fact, most often, very academic Christians have written about God, the scriptures, creation, fall, redemption, and then sometimes they get around to Jesus, but then they often die before they write about the Holy Spirit. So in some sense, the church is a little impoverished in its understanding of the Holy Spirit. But what I have right here is my bibliography. These are all the books that have helped to inform my understanding of the Holy Spirit, and more than that, what the Holy Spirit enlivens us to do, which is to live in this world. Jürgen Moltmann has got a really good understanding of Holy Spirit when he says, Holy Spirit is concerned with the totality of a person, their entire being. But not only that, not just you or me, but everything that lives has some semblance or some connection to Spirit making it alive. More than that, if your understanding of the Holy Spirit only involves Christians but doesn't have the Holy Spirit already active in non-Christians' lives, um, you're wrong. <laughs> However, I do need to say this. The Holy Spirit is probably the person of the Trinity that, like I said, we all often overlook the most. We get the word spirit from that other word, respiration. They're, they're all connected in the Latin. Spirit has to do with everything that involves you coming to life. Everything that breathes life into you somehow has the Holy Spirit in it. Everything that makes you alive is already blessed by God. Now, I use that phrase very intentionally because this past week has been very revealing. I don't think that this past week we've actually had an increase in injustice and in racism and also classism and sexism. What's really been happening is things are being revealed that have always been there. And in the face of that, we've got to ask, what is the Holy Spirit? Where is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? And what does it mean to speak with tongues of fire now? Because if we are Christians and if we are people that have the Holy Spirit, then there's no reason why we can't speak with tongues of fire today. Albert Camus was an existentialist philosopher who lived in France. And he was invited to a Dominican monastery. And he went and he spoke to all these monks right after the wake of World War II. And as a non-Christian, he said to these monks, there can be no question in the minds and the hearts of the rest of the world as towards whether or not you affirm or deny, whether you endorse or denounce the atrocities that happened in World War II. And it's powerful that a monastery invited a non-Christian and the non-Christian reminded the monks of their prophetic call of what they're supposed to do with their life. To speak with tongues of fire means that you affirm and you negate things. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit more later on. N.T. Wright writes this book about the day the revolution began, all about Easter, the resurrection day. And if you've seen the other video that I did about the divine insurrection, that book was a fair bit of the inspiration. The Pentecost is supposed to be connected to Easter. And Pentecost is when the church was launched into its mission of being revolutionaries and insurrectionists for the kingdom in this world. When we sit back and we say, oh, let's let go and let God take care of this, we're actually not doing what Easter was all about. When we pray that Jesus needs to be present in a particular situation, what we really should be saying is, Jesus, make yourself present in me as I'm present to this situation. Because that's what Jesus did. He didn't stand on the sidelines. 
Julian of Norwich, in her writings, talks about how all of us are one. She uses it as a verb, actually. O-N-E-I-N-G. Oneing. There's a uniting. And she even uses the image of strings being tied into a knot. All of us are connected. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one lives, we all live. When one's healed, we are all healed. When one grieves, we all grieve. But there's an intimacy that cannot be broken and should not be broken. Pentecost is about the unifying of people around the name of Jesus. And anything that encourages disconnection is inherently unchristian. When we say that all are one in Christ, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, what we're saying is that there is no place for racism, sexism, or classism within the church. We are all one, knotted. We are oneed. Walter Brueggemann wrote a really good book, that one right there, about the prophetic imagination. And every single one of us have got to step into this understanding that there's a prophetic role that each of us need to fulfill. In some sense, literally to speak with tongues of fire. Actually, that's metaphorically. Anyways, but he says, all societies have inherent liturgies, have these processes that tell us how to live and be in the world. And that the church and its liturgy is supposed to be a subversion of the cultural liturgy that's trying to tell us how to live and act, be, move, speak. And so in that sense, we all have to pay attention to what informs us. And hopefully the church and its teaching is teaching you to be an insurrectionist for what is good, for what is true, for what is beautiful. Abraham Joshua Heschel was a rabbi who was a friend with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You might even see him in some pictures. He showed me that prophets don't only just care about the future, some eschatological, divine, heavenly future. They actually speak very much to the life that's happening now. The prophets, yes, they did speak prophecies about Jesus, but they also very much spoke against the priesthood and the royalty of their day for their injustices. We do a major disservice to the prophets when we diminish them and we think that they're only talking about Jesus and not also about the events of their day and calling out political and religious oppression or abuses. And so in that same lineage, we have people like Daniel Berrigan, who was a Jesuit priest who, get this, broke into a government building, yup, during Vietnam, took a filing cabinet, or a few of them, that were housing draft cards that were being used to draft people into what he thought was an unjust war. He pulled them out into the parking lot and set them on fire, where then he was arrested one of many, many times. A good question would be whether or not that fire that burned those draft cards was also the fire of the Holy Spirit. I'll let you think about that. Howard Thurman wrote this good book called Jesus and the Disinherited about how we all need to stop and recognize that Jesus was all about siding with the oppressed, with those who, quote, have the heel of the empire on their neck. Howard Thurman spoke very much about Jesus was quite aware of what it meant to be of those people that have their backs up against the wall. Because in his day, the Jewish people were those that had their backs up against the wall, didn't have much of an opportunity for other angles or escapes. So he actually understood what it meant to be oppressed in a way that we can't quite. Well, maybe some of us can. But that book was actually carried by Martin Luther King Jr. along with a copy of the Bible at most of his speeches. He actually considered Howard Thurman one of his mentors and friends. How interesting. I have a feeling Martin Luther King Jr. spoke with tongues of fire. He was a Pentecost person. Thomas Merton wrote this, uh, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, and the title alone is worth it. When you stop and realize that he understood his own life in some sense as being a guilty bystander of not having stood up when he should have for not intercepting certain things and instead was just a bystander. He wrote against nuclear warfare, wrote against racism, 
I think he would say some very profound things today about what it means to be a guilty bystander and to realize that neutrality doesn't mean you're innocent. Soren Kierkegaard was another prophetic person of Pentecost, wrote about how love means that you care about the good of the other. And if you don't care about the good of other people, then you probably don't really have love within you. And then that means that you're not fulfilling the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. In this, he talks very much about the need to love other people and to do what they can't do for themselves. Another prophetic person would be Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This is the best biography you could buy by Eberhard Betke. This was his best friend who wrote uh, more than a thousand pages on his life. You can't beat this biography. But one of the things that Bonhoeffer said that I love is that when the wheels of injustice are treading over and trampling people, it's not enough just to point it out. We must shove something into the spokes of the wheel to stop the whole machine from treading over people. Bonhoeffer is legendary because he worked actively against the Nazi regime, and then on top of that was actually tangentially a part of an assassination attempt against Hitler. All of these people are people of faith, and none of these people really get the highlight that they really ought. I believe that a lot of church folk probably maybe know a few of these names, but not all of them. But that brings me to this last book. Bonaventure is how we know about St. Francis. He wrote this, the best biography of St. Francis, but in this, his entire faith can be summed up by one phrase, the burning love of the crucified one. And for him, the burning love was the access point or the gateway by which all things and all people must, must go through in order to have union with God, the burning love of the crucified one. Now there's something beautiful. Fire in Greek is spelled P-U-R. It's where we get the word purity from or pure. To have something put on fire can mean that it's being made pure. On Pentecost, these early Christians were given the Holy Spirit and it set their tongues on fire. Their words were purified and they were able to speak about what matters most, the person of Jesus. Now, when we speak the name of Jesus, when we do that, we've got to do two things. We have to affirm soul, but we also have to affirm body because Jesus is divine and human put together, somehow 100% both, And so that means when we preach a gospel, when we speak with tongues of fire, it's got to have access to the soul, and it also has to enrich or speak to and affirm the body as well. So here's the thought. If your understanding of the gospel is only about soul, but doesn't include the the whole thriving of the body, it's not a real gospel. Or if your understanding of the gospel only pays attention to the body, but has nothing to do with the interior soul of someone, then it's not gospel either. Going back to Jürgen Moltmann, we've got to have a gospel that's wholesale interested in the holistic person. Now, okay, that's all the backdrop, right? That's all the information that we have to deal with right now. So here's, here's what we need to do. And I want to speak to you rather directly What does it mean for us to have tongues of fire today? Great, we have Pentecost to remember that those people back then spoke with tongues of fire, but what does it mean for us today, now, to have tongues of fire? Well, it means that you and I have got to start preaching whole gospels that care about the soul and the body, that care about the person and care about society that care about the internal world, the external world, that has to do with burning away all the impurities that we all have. Racism, classism, sexism, all of these things need to pass through the burning fire of the love of the crucified one. You and I have a moral obligation to affirm and deny things, to affirm every way in which people can come alive. Spirit, through medicine, 
through health, through social interactions, speak affirmation about those things while also speaking with tongues of fire and negation against all the things that diminish people, all the ways in which people die, in which all the ways people might have the heel of the empire on their neck. This is what it means to speak with tongues of fire. It means that your understanding of Jesus affirms the best things of life and denies the worst. That your understanding of Jesus is all about the soul as well as the body. To speak with tongues of fire means that you and I have the holy obligation of setting the world on fire. Now, not physically, but spiritually, you and I have an obligation to continue the insurrection, the revolution of Jesus into today's world where we find ourselves now. So let yourself this week become a Pentecost person. Speak words of affirmation of the things that should be affirmed. Speak denouncement of things that deserve to be denounced. Be someone who, like Albert Camus says, the world can have no question in their heart and mind what you're really about. Make sure the world knows that you're about Jesus and a holistic gospel. I don't know what else to say. I don't even know how to finish this. This past week I've had a lot of anger and sadness and complete bewilderment about what to say right now, but let me say this. Set the world on fire with the burning love of the crucified one and make sure you pass through that first so that you can lead other people too.